Ralph, 2023 tem sido um ano surpreendentemente muito positivo para o mercado de ações americanos. Né? Ele tem, vem mostrando uma resiliência e o S&P 500 está dando em torno de 15% ao ano. Conta para a gente é, se isso vai continuar subindo né? e como é que, qual é o papel da inteligência artificial é, na sua expectativa? Well, as you mentioned, the S&P 500 has done really, really well up to this point in the year. However, we do think that valuations at this level are a little bit stretched. That doesn't mean it can't go further, but there are a number of factors that we've identified that we think push the market higher uh, over the past three to six months that may be reversing right now. And that's something that we're watching. Mm -hmm. In terms of artificial intelligence, that has actually been a key driver of the markets and has really gotten retail investors interested. We think that there are opportunities within artificial intelligence. It can pull the market up a little bit further. However, we think a lot of the near-term uh, success of artificial intelligence has been priced in at current levels. So we're watching a number of different factors here. You know, you can never say never that the market won't continue to go up. But we think that the risk reward at this level might be a little bit in favor of the risk. Para entender os motivos da resiliência dos mercados de ações americanos, o papel da inteligência artificial, as expectativas e como isto está se refletindo nas alocações dos portfólios globais de ações, começa agora o Offshore Connection sobre o mercado de ações americano. Bem-vindos ao Offshore Connection. Eu sou Carol Okamura e trouxe aqui, aproveitei a vinda do Ralph Davidson, nosso Portfólio Manager de Ações Globais. Ele está aqui em São Paulo, aproveitei essa vinda como sempre para fazer mais um episódio para vocês. Bem-vindo, Ralph. Thank you very much. It's great to be back. <risos> Obrigada. É sempre um prazer tê-lo aqui. É sempre uma aula falar com você. É, então, a gente vai falar um pouquinho sobre o mercado de ações americanos. Ele está muito resiliente, né? A gente já começou falando sobre isso. É, qual a sua expectativa? Como, é que, como você analisa né, 2023 no mercado de ações americanos? E qual a sua expectativa né, em relação a esse mercado? O que, que te chama mais atenção? Well, it's interesting. Um, first of all, I think that the market has gone further up 15% year to date mm -hmm. than we expected at this point in the year. And I think if you remember entering the year, our view really was is that this time is different. And what did we mean by that is that we, were, we had identified a number of what we call technical indicators, uh, things like price movement, price action, sentiment, and things of that nature, which really suggested that the price would continue to move higher. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, we were looking at another a number of economic indicators, things like inverted yield curves, the leading economic indicators, which suggested that the U.S. economy might be slowing down. And each time that the U.S. economy has entered a recession in the past, uh, it has basically been coincided with new lows in the equity market. So on one hand, we had all of these technical indicators suggesting that the market would go up and a number of economic indicators that were suggesting that the market would go down. And so our view was, is this time, either which way that wins out, this time would be different. And what we've seen in the six months since then is that price has won out. Those technical indicators have won out. And I think that um, when we look back at the drivers of the market performance over the six months, over the past six months, there are a couple of really interesting characteristics that stand out to us. The first thing is, is that this has been what we call an exceedingly narrow market. And what that means is that it, very few shares have been leading this market up. And I'll give mm -hmm. you some examples. The first thing is, is that Yes, the market is up 15%. There are only three of the 11 U.S. sectors that are outperforming the index overall. In fact, five sectors are negative year to date. Um, so what are the three sectors that are outperforming? As you might imagine, it's technology, it's communications, which includes names like Google, Facebook, or Meta, uh, and it is consumer discretionary, which includes Amazon and Tesla. So all of those sort of high growth uh, names that, that people recognize have been leading the market higher. Obviously within the technology sector, we have companies like Apple and Nvidia mm -hmm. uh, and Microsoft. 
Um, so that's really been what's leading the market higher. On the other hand, there are a number of companies in more cyclical sectors, sectors like energy, financials, which are still negative year to date. Uh, and so we have what we consider to be a bifurcated market. And, and typically, those are a little bit more fragile uh, than a market with broad participation. And so what you sort of ask, the, or what we ask the question is, is will those Microsoft, NVIDIA's, Tesla's, Amazon's, Google's, Facebook's of the world, will they drag all the energy companies and financials higher? Or mm -hmm. will the weight of the energy and financials and uh, real estate and utilities companies drag those uh, drag the high growth companies lower? And so that's sort of the question that 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 uh, you know we find ourselves in at this point in the year. The second thing, or the second characteristic of this market through the rally that we find very very interesting is, in fact, if you go back to the October low in the U.S. Uh, the S&P has, has actually rallied about 27% since then, 15% year-to-date, 27% since the October low. And what you see since the October low is that the entire performance has actually been driven by multiple expansion. If you look at the earnings story in the S&P 500, actually uh, next 12 months earnings expectations since the October low have come down 2%. So 100% plus of the rally from the low in the equity market in the US can be explained by multiple expansion. And you know that is not necessarily sustainable. Um, and, and what we need to see now is we need to see follow through from earnings. And that's great. However, when we speak to our macro strategists, when we speak to economists, what they say is there's probably slowing growth in the US economy. And so we're trying to understand mm -hmm. uh, the earnings expectations uh, within that context of, of the slowing uh, economic growth expectations from the economists and, and from the Fed itself, truthfully. When we look back at, you know, so those are the characteristics of the market. The, the first thing is, is that it's been led higher by very few names. The second thing is, is it's been driven by PE multiple expansion. I think that when we look at the market, there's been sort of a, um, I don't know if I would call it misunderstood or, or relatively unknown factor, which has helped drive the markets higher over the past six months, and, and that is liquidity. We're all considering mm -hmm. that the Fed is in a tightening cycle right now. Everybody has been focused on, you know, when, what the Fed's next move will be. Are they going to hike rates? Uh, their most recent announcement uh, and, and the dot plot, the 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 forward expectations of the next Fed movements, came out, I think, and surprised many people by suggesting that there could be more rate hikes uh, later into the year. And, and in fact, we're expecting at least one more rate hike uh, mm -hmm. before the cycle is completed. But if we put the rate hike cycle aside and we focus on the Fed's balance sheet, that's where we think that, um, you know, may have that that might be a factor in driving the markets higher. Now, the, the Fed's balance sheet from the time they began reducing it through their quantitative tightening measures, they began t uh, reducing the balance sheet in, in April of 2022. Now, it went down uh, about six or seven hundred billion dollars between April or May of 2022 and March of 2023. What happened in March is we had the regional banking turmoil, at which point the Fed expanded its balance sheet, uh, you know, what, which we would generally call quantitative easing. Uh, by about uh, $350 billion. So it had come down by $700 billion. They expanded it back by $350 billion. So this was a huge liquidity event mm -hmm. in the U.S. that not a lot of people were focused on. Why? Because they're focused on the rate hike cycle. And so we think that this, this, this liquidity helped drive equities higher through uh, April and May. The other thing that's sort of uh, a liquidity provider to the markets was the debt ceiling negotiations in the U.S. Uh, what's happened this year, or what happened in January, is the U.S. hit what's known as its debt ceiling. Um, in, in order for the U.S. to have or to, to issue any more debt, they needed an, uh, an agreement from Congress, 
And so that we had stopped basically issuing treasury securities in order to fund the operations of the government. And we stopped at a level of $31 trillion in treasury securities. So how did from and we hit that level in January, which is known as the debt ceiling. Mm -hmm. And so from January through late May, how did the, the federal government fund itself and its commitments is the treasury not the Fed, the Treasury actually has a savings account called the Treasury General Account. And so what it did over these uh, four or five months is it provided liquidity from the general account. It basically drained its savings account in order to pay the bills of the government. Now that a, a debt ceiling agreement has been reached, we think that, in fact, the Treasury's got to reverse this. They've got to fill their savings account and they're going, to, they're going to actually fund the operations of the government by issuing treasuries. So this is, it, it's sort of counterintuitive, but issuing treasuries and borrowing is a drain of liquidity from mm -hmm. the market. And even if the treasury tries to do this in the, the most or, or the least disruptive way possible for all markets out there, even just removing that liquidity and going back to this quantitative tightening that the Fed was doing may actually be a, a reversal in the liquidity scenario that we saw in the first half of the year. The other driver that we saw in, in markets over the last couple of months has, has been artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. um, artificial intelligence led retail investors into equity markets. It really gained a lot of excitement. The challenge that we have with artificial intelligence is really understanding where the revenues will come from. You know, a company like BTG, how are we gonna use artificial intelligence to drive revenues? Are we, are we not? Is it gonna be a cost reduction uh, element for us where we can bring artificial intelligence in and find ways that we can become more productive as a company. Whatever that is, we think that that's for most companies about a year and a half to maybe two and a half years out. I think about the mobile phone revolution uh, when the iPhone mm -hmm. was released. The big killer apps on the iPhone weren't really known for about a year and a half, two years later. Things like Uber, things like Instagram. Um, there are other apps out there, Waze maybe. All of those big apps that took advantage of the mobile uh, ecosystem and the app ecosystem that, that Apple helped uh, define and drive really didn't occur for about a year and a half to two years later. And so I think for most companies, that's really going to be the impact of AI. Um, we do recognize that there should be some productivity in the future. I think it is a little bit difficult to, to determine right now. Obviously, there are companies like NVIDIA, um, where because uh, the large language models that drive AI um, require a lot of computing power. NVIDIA is uniquely positioned mm -hmm. in order to offer this. And I'm just going to step aside here and, and, and just try to explain that for yeah, a second. It's because NVIDIA doesn't have the most powerful, fastest chips out there, but what it, it has the ability to do is to link their chips together unlike AMD, unlike Intel, unlike Broadcom, unlike the other chips that are available, in order to create the computing power necessary to drive the, the learning uh, for these large language models that drive AI. So what does that mean? It means that they don't just use the individual chip, they have the ability to combine all of their chips and make them that much more powerful other companies have not yet been, they might have more powerful chips individually, but they can't combine and make their chips work together in order to create that computing power. So NVIDIA, uh, we do think is a special circumstance. However, NVIDIA now is trading at 25 times 2024 sales, not earnings, 2024 mm -hmm. sales. Um, and so there's some, a good portion of good news that's been priced into those shares. Microsoft is another name that we think is a, a big beneficiary of artificial intelligence, um, that where they are a big investor in OpenAI, the company behind ChatGBT. Um, I think one of the challenges that I see, though, is 
you know, I use I use artificial intelligence and chat GPT almost like a Google on steroids. And the interesting part about that for me is uh, when I put something into Google, uh, the the legacy, uh, I, I guess the legacy search engine, what comes back is a lot of advertiser driven results. So if I said I want to have the best restaurants in Sao Paulo, like they, you know, mm. anybody who pays Google a lot of money is going to come to the top of that list. There are going to be travel sites that come to the top of that list. When I go into a chat GPT and I say I want the best Italian restaurants, it, scra it scrapes the web. It goes to through all of its large language models. It, it sees what else is out there. And it comes back with an authentic response or a, a excuse me, it's an artificial response based on, um, you know, everything else out there. But it's not advertiser driven. What I do believe going forward is I do believe that the real AI is authentic intelligence, which is me and you, it's people. Mm -hmm. What what artificial intelligence is doing is it is using the best of the historical authentic intelligence in order to drive results. But in order for society to progress, for uh, to overcome large challenges, we're still reliant on authentic intelligence. And I think that that takes place across a number of different industries, including the green revolution, including, uh, you know, whether it's how are we going to use carbon fuels in the future as we transition to less carbon oriented future. Uh, and, and the way that we're going to solve the world's big problems is still going to be somewhat reliant on authentic intelligence. So I am bullish like everybody else and excited about artificial intelligence. But I think, um, A, it's a little bit priced in at this point, And B, mm -hmm. we still need to rely on authentic intelligence as the real AI. Um, the final thing I wanted to talk about was, you know, getting into valuation. Mm -hmm. um, where are we now with valuation is that the S&P 500 overall is trading at about 19.3 times next year's earnings. Now, this is an elevated level outside of the two valuation bubbles that we've seen in the past 25 years. The first one was the dot-com bubble. The second one was really the post-COVID bubble. This is the highest level uh, in, the, in the PE ratio that we've seen. And if we were to go back to the dot-com bubble and we were to go back to the post-COVID bubble, both of those, again, were, were sort of inflated by easy monetary policy. Now, remember, I told you, yes, the Fed is tightening, but over here, we've had the Fed and the Treasury providing liquidity, which we think has offset some of the tightening measures that the Fed has been doing. Now, as I mentioned, those are being reversed. So we could see, again, that valuation contract a little bit. We will see. I will say that the other aspect of the markets that maybe I underestimated as we came into the year, which has been a driver for performance, has been sentiment. As we entered the year, everybody was negative, or it felt like everybody was negative. Uh, the consensus was negative. All of the Wall Street banks were, with the exception of very few, were negative. They saw the p possibility of a recession. I think the mm -hmm. consensus view was really, you know what? Markets are going to have a difficult first half and a great second half. It may be that that's reversed. Uh, so what we've seen is that sentiment, which what we call was overwhelmingly bearish to start the year, has now flipped and has become somewhat bullish. Uh, there's surveys that we watch. I watch put call ratios. The CNN has a fear and greed index, which is now in an extreme greed. And we view these all as contrarian indicators. And maybe I should have respected them more earlier in the year. The interesting part now is that they flipped a little bit. I will also say that one of our, our the factors or characteristics that we watched and followed a lot last year was seasonality. And I talked about this, and some people sort of discounted it. But if you looked at the seasonality in 2022, uh, which is the midterm election year, it was pretty accurate. Typically, in a midterm election year, markets go down in the mm -hmm. first quarter. They sort of trade sideways, and they rally at the end of the year. That's exactly what happened. What's interesting is, is that seasonality uh, for what we call the pre-election year, which is what we're in now, 
Seasonality is very strong, so it, it sort of suggests positive markets through the first four or five months of the pre-election year, so through May. And then the period through really June through September, October, historically have been weak in these, uh, in these uh, pre-election years. So we think that there might be a confluence of factors, a number of factors right now, which whether it's li liquidity, which is reversing, sentiment, which has gone from bearish to bullish, uh, mm -hmm. and even seasonality, um, which aren't really in our favor right now at a time when the S&P 500 is trading at a premium multiple. Like I said earlier, does that mean it, it has to stop going up? Absolutely not. Um, I think one of the things that we've learned is that valuation or the PE multiple in the markets is not a catalyst. What, the way we view valuation is we say, listen, it's a measure of risk. It basically means a, a market at 19.3 times is riskier than a market at 12 times forward earnings. Um, and, and that's where we see things. And so when we do our evaluation of where the market is today, we say to ourselves, the risk likely outweighs the upside potential in the near term over the next three to six months. However, we also recognize that our clients are long-term investors. We like to give long-term mm -hmm. advice. And this does not mean you should sell. In fact, we have been underweight equities uh, since the end of January when the S&P was at about 4150. So we captured the first 7% or 8% of this year's rally. Uh, and we've been slightly underweight, so of for the next seven or eight percent of this year's rally, um, but we're still invested. Uh, we're still, you know, for most clients, they have ninety-five percent of their normal equity allocation within our models, and we believe that that is the way that long-term investors can continue to navigate throughout this environment. É, essa seria a minha próxima pergunta. Você já juntou tudo, foi ótimo. Falou sobre o mercado, né? nosso, nosso cenário, as expectativas e falando sobre os clientes que têm portfólios alocados, como você está navegando nesse período. Né? O que está underweight, o que está overweight, é, como você está navegando e analisando os portfólios hoje e daqui para frente. Perfeito. Então, eu acho que a primeira coisa que eu diria, e eu quero reenfocar, é que, mesmo quando estamos underweight, that means we have a pretty high allocation to equities yeah. or, or uh, clients maintain a lot of exposure to equities. It does not mean 0% mm -hmm. ever. The way that we uh, approach portfolios is through an asset allocation framework. And what that means is that we combine different asset classes in order to, based on uh, risk and return assumptions, in order to provide clients with the best risk adjusted returns mm -hmm. for any risk profile that they have. And I think um, the key to those models is combining equities, fixed income, sometimes commodities mm -hmm. or alternatives in order to uh, be as efficient as possible in, in providing the best risk adjusted returns. And those models, again, are, are based on allocations and the allocations don't go to zero. Mm -hmm. Uh, even when our expectation in equity markets is for volatility, we don't go to zero. And I think that that's really important. You know, I think yeah. there was some confusion when we mm -hmm. went to underweight at the end of January, mm -hmm. when the uh, S&P 500 was at 4150, a number of clients came to us and said, I'm going to wait. I don't yeah. want to buy now. This is risky. And what or we're going to sell. And or I'm going to yeah. sell. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, and, and what we've seen is that you know, I, I don't view us as wrong. I think mm -hmm. the analysis was right. Um, but the market can c continue to go up, and we recognize that, which is part of the reason we don't go to zero. Mm -hmm. um, Isso é muito importante. Sorry to interrupt you. Mm -hmm. Isso é muito importante. A gente reforça muito quando o Santucci estava aqui. A gente, no último episódio, a gente falou sobre essa disciplina de investimento, sobre essa importância de alocação de ativos e, e, e equilibrar o portfólio entre renda fixa, renda variável, o underweight do renda variável. A gente não está zerado. E até porque, por exemplo, agora, né, 15% de retorno Quem estava zerado não, não pegou esse, né, esse rally. Então, isso é and, muito importante enfatizar. And I think discipline is a key to mm -hmm. success in investments. É. Um, we see a number of people who, you know, historically, what you see is investors sell uh, at the bottom 
and mm-hmm. buy at the top. Mm-hmm. It's just, it's human nature. And, and yeah. that is one of the things that we really try to bring to our investment process mm-hmm. is discipline, patience, a long-term view, a respect for history. And we try to buy when there's, when there's fear in the streets or blood in the streets, as the mm-hmm. expression is, and, and sell when others are, are what we perceive to be greedy or the risk reward in our view is no longer in our favor. Um, and, and so that is, that is hopefully what we can bring to uh, portfolio management. And, and I think we've done that very, very successfully uh, over the past three to five mm-hmm. years. Um, it has been a challenging market environment uh, from a uh, point of view that the equity market has gone higher uh, and faster than we would have expected. It has been driven by multiple expansion. And what we're really going to begin to look at in, in about a month, we begin second quarter uh, earnings season in the U.S. Now, if you remember, the first quarter earnings season was really characterized by um, expectations coming down and then companies expe- exceeding those lowered expectations. What we've continued to see is that second quarter earnings expectations have continued to come down as well. I wouldn't be surprised to see uh, the earnings once again exceed these lower, mm-hmm. lowered expectations, but we want to continue to watch what companies are saying about the future. Uh, and as I mentioned, even since last October, what we're seeing is is that earnings growth expectations have come down by about two, two and a half percent. Um, we continue to believe that 2024 S and P 500 earnings expectations, which are currently about 247 dollars for the entire S and P 500, are too high. Uh, what? Wh- why is that? That represents roughly 12 percent growth off of the $220 in earnings expectations for 2023. And as I mentioned, as we talk to economists, they say, listen, the U.S. is slowing. Uh, We can look at retail sales numbers that show sort of a little bit of a slowdown there. Uh, We can look at PMIs and and, and different indicators that show slowing growth. But the bottom line is, is that the U.S. seems to be slowing. This is a good thing because it helps Uh, inflation come down, which has been a little bit of a challenge for us for the first time in a long time in the U.S. But on the other hand, when we look at the earnings growth expectation, we think that it's going to be difficult to achieve 12 percent earnings growth next year in Mm -hmm. in a slowing economic environment. We think about a 6 percent earnings growth next year is probably more realistic. So that gets you to about 230 or 235 dollars in earnings for 2024. So we're expecting those earnings expectations numbers to come down. That's okay. What the earnings expectations for 2023 have been coming down for some time. The way we always talk about it though is it's okay if we have a slowly leaking balloon. So the air is slowly coming out of the earnings expectation story. What we don't want to see is a popping balloon. And what I mean by that is if you were to go back to September 2000, Mm -hmm. Uh, And don't forget, yes, the peak in uh, the dot-com bubble was in March. The the equity market actually rallied back to September based on the fact that the Fed was pausing rate hikes. Um, But what happened in September was a number of companies came out all at the same time, and they said, we're really going to miss our earnings expectations number. And that's what caused the the, the real market sell-off in the dot-com collapse. We don't want to see, and we characterize that as a popping balloon. They were missing earnings expectations by 20 or 30 percent, and there were wasn't just one company; it was 30 or 40 companies in the S and P 500 and Nasdaq at that time. So we don't want to see those big earnings misses. And even at 19 and a half times, we actually need to see companies other than Nvidia beat earnings expectations. And strangely enough, if you go back to Nvidia's earnings for Q1. Their Q1 earnings were down 20% year over year from 2022. However, what did they say? They said, listen, our earnings in Q2 are going to be 50% higher than we thought they were going to be based off the demand for our chips, based off of artificial intelligence. If we look at Apple, which is the biggest stock in the index, their earnings expectations have continued to come down. Mm -hmm. Uh, However, Apple is now a $3 trillion company, and it's trading, I think, at about 28 times next 12 months earnings. And 
that their growth in the share of Apple, which is, you know, hit, I think, an all time high last week, was all multiple expansion. We need the earnings from these best companies to come out and exceed expectations and start demonstrating real growth because 19 and a half times or 19 and a quarter times uh, earnings expectations is a demanding multiple. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and if we can't have the earnings follow through, there is a chance that that multiple can contract. And just to give you an indication, every one multiple point down, so you go from 19 and a quarter to 18 and a quarter, is nearly a 5% drop in the index. So that's where we are. Perfeito, Ralph. Acho que falamos aí, abordamos bastante coisa explicando o cenário atual de 2023. Quais são as expectativas, a nossa narrativa né, para isso, a sua visão, como é que entra a inteligência artificial e como é que estão os nossos portfólios alocados né, no Asset Allocation, o Equities, nessa posição. Agora vamos falar um pouquinho do, dos clientes. Né? So, last question. O que os clientes devem fazer, né, estão fazendo e como é que os portfólios em Equities estão alocados? Well, I think there are a couple of things that clients should do at this point. Mm -hmm. I think the first thing is is portfolio discipline, as we discussed. Mm -hmm. um, maintain a long-term perspective. And then the way that we are positioning portfolios right now is with an emphasis on what we consider to be quality companies. Now, you can say to me, listen, I always want quality companies. At what point don't I want quality companies? Mm -hmm. But the way we characterize quality companies are companies that have strong returns on equity, consistent cash flows, strong balance sheets that aren't over leveraged. Mm -hmm. uh, and we think that even in the event of some sort of an economic slowdown, that these are the types of companies that we believe will outperform. And we really haven't taken heavy sector bets within this environment. What we prefer to do is to remain diversified. Mm -hmm. um, but within each sector, identify those companies that we consider to be quality, that have the characteristics that I described before, that we think can outperform over the long term. The other final key, and we mentioned this before, is this is not a time to sell. Mm -hmm. um, it might not be the time to increase an allocation, um, but it is not the time to sell or go to zero. Uh, what we think we can do is we can refine portfolios, make sure that we've got quality companies in there, Uh, and and what what we often do with clients is help them upgrade their positions. Um, and, and so that's the way that we're trying to navigate in this environment. And I think truthfully, we've done a pretty good job up till this point in the year. But maybe the challenges are coming. Yeah. Perfeito, Ralph. Muito obrigada. Thank you very much again. Thank you for being here. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. Bom, eu acho que o recado final aqui do Ralph né, foi muito importante, é o que a gente sempre bate, o que é muito importante, a gente, o que a gente quer passar, né? Ter a disciplina de investimentos, o conhecimento de investi do, do que está investindo, né? E ter calma na hora de investir. É, a gente está trazendo aqui é, informações, o Ralph Davidson, ele é americano, ele trabalha há mais de 20 anos com, no, com portfólio de ações americanos, né? mas ele trabalha com brasileiros, então ele entende a cabeça dos brasileiros, né? dos investidores brasileiros, mas com um portfólio é, com ações americanas, ele é um americano, então ele sabe navegar muito bem, então é sempre muito bom tê-lo aqui para trazer esse tipo de informação para a gente, para os nossos ouvintes. Thank you very much again. Thank you. And if anybody comes to New York, please visit me. <laughs> <laughs> Muito obrigada. Obrigada a vocês que nos acompanharam até aqui. Chegamos ao final de mais uma edição do Offshore Connection. Esperamos que você tenha gostado e que as informações compartilhadas tenham sido úteis para expandir o seu conhecimento sobre diversificação global. Mas se você ainda tiver alguma dúvida ou se quiser compartilhar sua opinião sobre o episódio, deixe um comentário abaixo. Nós estamos sempre à disposição para conversar e ajudá-lo da melhor forma possível. E não se esqueça de se inscrever no nosso canal e ativar as notificações para não perder nenhum episódio da Offshore Connection Diversificação Global. Nos vemos em breve!